And I'm going to ask that we go to the next slide so I can go over the agenda. So my name is Serena Muhammad. I am the Director of Strategic Initiatives for the St. Louis Mental Health Board, and we provide staff support for the St. Louis Area Violence Prevention Commission. Um, tonight, we're going to talk a little bit about the Violence Prevention Commission for those who are unfamiliar with our work, as well as why we are focused in on the collective bargaining agreement and why we think this is an important issue to bring to the attention of the community. So we'll have a discussion of some specific themes that we've learned in talking about this issue over the course of the last few months, as well as in talking about policing and community relations in general over the past year. And those community engagement committee members who are a part of the Violence Prevention Commission will lead those discussions. And then at the end of the meeting, we'll talk about the future process for collective bargaining, collective bargaining agreement input and next steps. And that will be done by Jessica Myers. Next slide. So who is the Violence Prevention Commission? Um, many of the folks on this panel are active members of that commission, but we are a, a member agencies uh, of 60 plus, and we engage about 120 agencies on a regular basis in our quarterly meetings to talk about how we can work collaboratively to address violence. Um, we are very rooted in research and evidence base, which means that we look at what is working across the country. We talk to our community members about what they would like to see happening in their neighborhoods, and that's how we inform our strategies. We take a public health approach. Uh, we rely heavily on the Prevention Institute and much of the research that they've already done about what works in violence prevention. And we use all of that information to develop our priorities. Um, as you can imagine, violence is a complex issue. There are multiple entry points for how it can be addressed. And we wanted to make sure that as a collective, we were looking at the areas where we would have the greatest impact and that we thought would make um, the most sense for us using our public health approach. So when you see these objectives, they weren't things that we just kind of pulled out of a hat. It's really based on what the Department of Justice report told us in their diagnostics report um, in 2017. It's based on a response needs and res risk needs and responsivity report that was conducted in 2018. Um, it's, it's based on a planning process that was conducted by the health departments in the city and the county and multiple stakeholders getting together, reviewing that information, and really discussing how we could apply it in our region. So these objectives, responding to non-fatal shootings, focusing on trauma-informed systems, and then really listening to community attitudes about police legitimacy are where we have focused our attention, because according to research, we know that if we are effective in these areas, it has the greatest impact in actually driving down the violence that we're seeing in our region. Next slide. So this is a picture of some of our committee members. Um, and we, I think this is Wear Orange Day. Um, but it's important to emphasize that this is a cross-sector and regional initiative. And it's a coalition of the willing. There are a lot of groups working on violence prevention. And what we recognize very early on is that it is difficult to accomplish as much as we would like to accomplish when we're working in silos or when we're working at cross purposes. So our intent is to always convene a space for folks who are willing to work together, willing to share information, and who want to collaborate so that we could achieve a greater impact. Next slide. So our community engagement committee is the committee that has been driving uh, much of the work behind this specific strategy and have helped to plan tonight's town hall. I should mention that traditional town halls, we would have the opportunity to hear from folks directly. We've had to structure this a little differently. So you'll hear some pauses as we give people the opportunity to respond to polls, to type questions in the chat, to have conversations in the chat. We want it to be interactive, but we understand that with the Zoom technology, sometimes the more open you are, um, the more risk you run of being kind of uh, distracted or taken off topic. So we wanna make sure that we're not a victim of any Zoom bombing or anything weird. And uh, that's why the communication is a little different, but it's, it's still intended to be a vehicle for us to hear from you as community members. So when you hear that awkward silence, uh, if you're viewing this, we do have folks in the chat who are talking to each other, talking to us, asking questions, and then taking the time to think about how they're going to respond to the poll. 
So the Community Engagement Committee has been working over the past year, really trying to understand from the community's perspective where we should focus our energy and what's important to them as it relates to their personal safety in their homes and in their neighborhoods. Uh, we did listening sessions on community policing for about a year. We went to multiple locations and we also did a survey so that we could get information from folks who were not able to attend those sessions in person. We want to emphasize that as we were planning this, we recognize that community is not just civilians. Community is also law enforcement. Police officers live in community. They are part of the community. And we wanted to make sure that we spoke with police officers directly and we got information from them as well. So what you will hear tonight is a representation of information that we received from community members as well as law enforcement. And one of the things that we noticed very, uh, very readily is that there's a lot of overlap in what some of the mutual concerns are and what some of the solutions are that were proposed by both groups. Next slide. So what did we hear in this listening session process? Again, emphasizing that we did talk to police and residents. Um, we talked about things like how officers are promoted and hired. Um, there's a lot of discussion about who is offering policing services, what types of services people want to see in the community, uh, what makes residents feel at ease and comfortable and safe, um, and how police like to engage in community. So all of those conversations kind of came up through that police legitimacy process. Um, we wanted to talk about what information can be shared. So we understand that there are some elements of policing that have to remain uh, private and that there are privacy laws that govern some of the things that occur uh, in the policing process. But there are also some things that the community could know and could benefit from knowing. So we wanted to explore how we have more transparent communication and information sharing. And the theme behind that information sharing is that the more we know and the more we understand, uh, the, the greater the opportunity to start to build those positive relationships between community and police, especially as it relates to our young people. And then the last thing that we talked about uh, that we heard from both police and residents is what could we do for those incidences that don't require uh, police to respond? If it's not a crime, but it could be a crisis of another sort, uh, what are some of our options for making sure that residents are served without overburdening or overtaxing police to respond to everything? Next slide. So we're gonna test out our polling question now because we're gonna be using the poll feature a lot this evening, as I said, to collect information. And we're gonna ask everyone to respond to this poll and we'll give you a couple of seconds to respond and we're tracking the percentage rate. So when we get to around a 90% response rate, we'll close the poll and we'll move on to the result. So there are two questions on the poll. How much did you know about the collective bargaining agreement before today's event? And did you watch our wonderful video that laid out the, the, the basics about what the collective bargaining agreement is about? So here are our results. Most people knew a little, some people knew nothing. Um, and about half of us watched the video and the other half did not. And that's useful for me so that I'll know how much detail to go into as I talk about what the collective bargaining agreement is. Next slide. Okay, so what is a collective bargaining agreement? It's basically a contract and it governs how police do their jobs. Um, and again, you can feel free to continue to drop questions in the chat if you have them. Uh, the reason that this is important is because as public servants, uh, police have a significant amount of right and responsibility in how they interact with the community. So how they do their jobs directly impacts us as individuals and as community members. So it's important to us to understand what some of their uh, restraints are, what some of their parameters are, and what things we should look for to determine whether or not we have a, a law enforcement agency that is healthy and fully functioning based on the terms of that, that agreement. Next slide. So there are legal 
parties who participate in negotiating the collective bargaining agreement. So we're talking about public input tonight, but we understand that the public is not a, a, a negotiating party in the CBA. The folks who actually have to sit down and reach an agreement and sign on the dotted line are the police department, the public safety director, St. Louis City, and in, in this case, it's um, the personnel department of St. Louis City and the St. Louis Police Officers Association or the police union. So these are the, these are the parties that have to reach an agreement about the contract that governs policing. Next slide. So what kind of information does the CBA include? Um, of course, it includes salary, but it also takes into account things like vacation and sick leave, uh, where officers live, what kind of information the public will have about officers, what happens when officers do something wrong, so what are the disciplinary policies, and then how often officers can get mental health testing. And these are just kind of a sample. Uh, as you would imagine, a contract has lots of areas that really govern the day-to-day -day operations, but we lifted these up as being issues that most people would want to be familiar with and understand that when we run into uh, successes or barriers, a lot of it can be traced back to what is contained in the CBA. Next slide. So why should this matter to you? Um, primarily, when we look at this, when we look at public safety, or when we look at violence prevention as a public health issue, it's important to us that we have officers who are well, who can police the community in a well way. So what that means is that the CBA actually influences the health and wellness of police officers. When you think about things like mental health screenings, their ability to take sick time, vacation, all of that plays into uh, how well they can function on the job, their decision making, their interactions with the public, um, and, and those things are, are, are governed by what's in this document. It also lays out what information that the community can have. So sometimes what we heard from community is that policing and law enforcement feels like a black box. If you're not on the inside, you don't really know what's happening or how decisions are made. And some of the frustration that comes from community is just not understanding process. So we think this is a good opportunity to kind of open that box, be transparent, have some greater accountability so that people can understand both the constraints and the opportunities um, that surround policing. And, and lastly, I want to pause on this one for a second because we hear a lot of um, public discourse now around use of force. And um, across the country, people are asking for databases and other ways to understand when police officers are using use of force. And even if we had the most robust database in the world, if the CBA does not allow for release of information, it would be empty. So a lot of what we want to see as it relates to transparency and building stronger community relationship really starts with what is allowable based on this document. Next slide. So we have, we have talked to uh, the St. Louis, the, that slide that showed those parties that are responsible for negotiating the CBA. We've talked to most of the folks that are, are involved in that process. And what we've sh shared with them is the benefit of having public input in the process. Across the country, there are cities who have started to incorporate public input into their collective bargaining agreement process. It has demonstrated an increase in cooperation between communities and police. And when we tie that back to the data, that has a direct result on clearance rates and the rates of violence. So what we understand is it's important for the public to have a voice in this process. And what we are offering is to be able to collect this information through our surveys, through the town hall meeting tonight. And then I think we'll have the survey open for another week after tonight so that we can go to those parties and say, here is what the community members that you serve would like to see. These are our hopes and these are our concerns. So when we collect this information, all of it will be uh, aggregated and shared with those who are responsible for the negotiation. None of it will be attributable, it will be anonymous, but we wanna be able to say that we've talked to these people, we've heard from these communities, and these are the things that we wanna lift up to your attention as you proceed in this negotiating process. Next slide. 
So now I believe I'm going to turn this over so that we can begin to talk about um, the issues that have actually started to surface uh, through our last process of doing the police legitimacy survey. So I'm gonna ask Amanda Holmes to facilitate our discussion on human resources. We do have a couple of questions really quick, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, just first off, uh, we have an M. Leopold asking, uh, does the SLMPD report the use of force to the FBI use of force database? So what I will say is we have, from our understanding, that reporting is not always complete and it's not compulsory. Gotcha. And then uh, John also has a question. Uh, given that the statute that established local control of police for the St. Louis mandated closed personnel records, how much impact can a change in the CBA make on opening the disciplinary process? Mandated. Are, are you talking about, oh, this is John. John, are you talking about the state mandate? I believe he is. Um, and I think the answer to that is that we're looking at a multi-level approach to this. So while the CBA can potentially um, deal with some of these issues, some of the issues will require um, looking at statewide laws as well. And one of those is privacy restrictions around closed personnel records. Um, so that is something that we will have to get more in depth with as we go forward. Okay. Thanks, Jessica. All right, I think those are the only questions. So I will turn it over to Amanda. Thank you, Serena. Um, so we're gonna go into our discussion about the human resources. Um, and so this will be about how the police department can recruit, retain and promote officers who want to improve relationships with community residents. I want to move to the next slide. Um, so in the survey, um, officers with the lowest performance ratings um, sh should be let go first um, rather than using seniority. That was a response from the survey. Additionally, um, the chief should be able to select his or her own executive staff rather than offering it to the most senior officers first. And finally, um, there were the top three things that should be included in an officer's evaluation are citizen complaints and compliments, working with neighborhood residents to solve those problems, as well as demonstrating positive contact with community residents. Um, and so we have a poll question for everyone to answer. Which of these recommendations from people who took the survey do you think would be most helpful to recruit more diverse officers who represent the community they serve? And we'll give you 30 to 60 seconds. Okay, so we have the results and the top answer we have is actively attended events focused on diversity when invited and welcomed. Um, we also see that competitive salaries and benefits is a top result. Additionally, we see more college recruiting and less military recruiting as um, a suggestion to recruit more diverse officers. Another one being one-on-one -on -one talks and mentoring programs, and also implementing mandatory community service for all officers. Also, um, if you answered othered, we'd love to see um, your ideas in the chat. So feel free to share them in the chat. Thank you, Mason. Okay, and we also have an open ended question for you all to respond to. So what are two or three things you think make someone a great police officer. And 
And so if you want to give your responses in the chat. I'm seeing compassion and empathy as um, top qualities, communication skills, respect for human life, integrity and compassion, empathy and great training, being a problem solver and community connected, humanity. Um, we're seeing quite a few people saying empathy and compassion, experience and patience, conflict management skills, um, being culturally competent, a shared or lived experience with the community and de-escalation skills. Another one is commitment to justice. We're seeing empathy show up quite a bit with you all's responses. Um, realizing they don't have to know all the answers and self-reflection. We see response that says maybe trained in social work before criminal justice and willingness to work with citizens, willingness to learn new skills and ideas. Thank you all so much for your wonderful answers. We also have um, a drive to help people, empathy coming up again, uh, conflict resolution and patience, a willingness to meet people where they are, where they're at, and thinking of what others go through on a daily basis. Another one, mental and physical health. Thank you all. Um, and we also have another open-ended question for you all to respond to. So how do you think citizens should be able to give positive and negative feedback on officers? We see someone say an anonymous online survey um, to supervisors through the Civilian Oversight Board, a survey sent out after a police report is written, um, contacting the local, local agency directly in an online forum or a survey, the Citizen Oversight Board, um, anonymous to a group not affiliated with the police department. Another um, participant said a standalone agency. We should have a place to call we should have a place when we can call and report an officer by name, badge number, and we should be able to follow what happens to our complaint. Someone said there should be an express system to address things the right way. Another one that says multiple ways to do so, survey sent to communities, oversight and community meetings, as well as a hotline. A survey, but not always to the public, maybe try different ways. Thank you all so much for being really active and engaging in the chat. Um, we will definitely know all of your, um, all of your responses. So thank you so much for your active participation. And we're gonna move on to transparency, transparency and accountability. And up next for transparency and accountability will be Dr. Sean Joe from Homegrown STL. Good evening, everyone. Uh, hope you can hear me properly. Um, the issue about transparency and accountability was a very important uh, thing to assess uh, and get community input on. Um, it's centered around how police share information with the community and what information can community have about officers accused of fired for or charged with wrongdoing. The sense of accountability really speaks to sense of fairness and equity in the process. So it's critically important that we really um, ask about it. And what the, what the community has shared so as far as 65% of the people surveyed said that the department should release the names of officers fired for misconduct or wrongfully injuring someone. They thought that was pretty important. 93% of the people surveyed think that there should be a way to track officers who are fired for misconduct um, and then join another department. Uh, some of these things we hear about nationally, but we also now getting some confirmation that locally, this is what residents are asking for. Uh, people feel more comfortable reporting suspected misconduct to a third party 
um, or to the civilian uh, oversight board, then doing it or sending that information to internal affairs division of the police department. So again, uh, many felt that they would rather uh, report their concerns to a third party um, or the civilian oversight board versus sending, uh, uh, sending that complaint into in internal affairs division of the police department. Next slide, please. So to get your additional input um, on this issue of transparency and accountability, we have a poll question for you. Do you know how to report alleged police officers misconduct to, to the internal affairs division in the police department? Do you know how to report alleged police officers misconduct to internal affairs division in the police department? Please take time to do so. And Dr. Joe, there's just a comment um, from Lynn saying that the community should not be kept from reported violence in the community, whether expunged or public. Um, officers' names, departments, and crimes should be made public in town meetings once a month or at least quarterly. Thank you. So the poll is open, please. I think the results are about to come up. Here we go. So you respond, thank you very much. I think we see that um, many, uh, it's a fair amount who do not know, um, again, how to report alleged officers misconduct to the Internal Affairs Division. Um, do you know how to report alleged, alleged affairs um, of misconduct to the Civilian Oversight Board? And again, majority do not. So we do think it's critically important as we go forward to ensure that the public has uh, knowledge of how to do so. So thank you very much. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we can go back one. I think we skipped one. Okay, so actually they were both in there. All right, let's go forward. Um, our next uh, question, and this is an open-ended question in that we wanted to make sure that we hear from you directly. What concerns or fears would you have reporting alleged police misconduct to internal affairs? or to the Civilian Oversight Board. What concerns or fear would you have about reporting such con police misconduct to internal affairs or the Oversight Board? So if you can please begin to uh, give your uh, responses in the chat, we'll be able to call them out as they're coming in. First two comments suggest retaliation, retaliation from the police if reporting uh, misconduct or retaliation from officers involved or friends of that officer, that the report will be ignored or not taken or, or assume not taken ser seriously, that I'll be told that I'm lying. If reporting to internal affairs, I'll be afraid of bias from the police department against me or not heard correctly. Again, there's concern for uh, safety that uh, that my name would be public and, and I assume they say, uh, and would accomplish little. Okay, so again, these are some of the concerns that, that you uh, provided, so thank you very much. How Dr. do you- Dr. Joe, if I could jump in before we before we go to the next question, I would also be interested if people drop into chat whether they would have the same fears about reporting it to a third party or whether that would help them to feel more safe or if they would have any concerns or fears about reporting to a third party. Thank you. So There's feel free to drop that in chat as well. Yes, please go right ahead. There were some additional comments here. I have no fear of the uh, COB, but any complaints they receive go to the Internal Affairs Division. Um, I've heard of retaliation uh, and there are strategies to charge the complaint, complaint with lots of petty crimes. So again, retaliation, there's concerning, this is a concerning matter um, as they may incentivize to not properly investigate or report in many crimes given. Um, Quick responses regarding the question of, of, of reporting that to a third party. I will feel safer, I just went up, I will feel safer reporting to a third party. A third party would be much better. 
uh, a third party will have to tell internal affairs division. I'm less afraid to report to third party, not as much fear. These are some of the comments. I still would be concerned, but just less so when reporting to a third party. This is always a way for people to sway the third party to not report accurately. And again, this issue of concern about fear of retaliation. So thank you all for your comments. That was extremely helpful. So this concern, I think we have uh, one more open question. Okay. And again, it's important to put this in context. The issue of transparency and accountability, there are many recommendations and it's critically important to have a fair system. I think the community is as committed to the idea that we want personal and public safety and we, ha we have the best police force that we can celebrate. So, so the question uh, that we wanna ask now is how do you know when a police department or force is effective? How do you know when a police department or force is effective? So if you can give your recommendations of how would you know, what are those benchmarks? What would tell you that it, from your opinion that the force or police service is effective? Please uh, put your answers in chat. All right, answers are beginning to come in. Please take your time. Go ahead. You have time to do so. Uh, how would we know when police department is effective? When there's durable reductions in serious crime? When there's little to no misconduct allegations? When all residents feel safe in the presence of police? The chief says he can fire poor officers. Um, the union doesn't force him to keep them. When people are safe in the community, they, they deal with crimes in humane and helpful ways, more like restorative justice. Again, the overall question is, how do we know when a police department is effective? And I'm just reading out those responses. When they can connect with community and gain the trust of community. Uh, when it holds officers accountable for their conduct. Again, another important response, people feel safer in their area. Uh, police has not been effective. I know by looking at the overcrowded prisons, uh, when we need a holistic public safety approach. We know when policing is effective, when officers are adequately supported in their jobs. There's an indication here about the, uh, there's a clearance rate that's, they would like to see that's better, crimes prevented rather than investigate, just, just investigated and solved. There's a decrease in, in crime, cases are resolved, no fear of calling police when help is needed. Um, can tell if police is effective when violent crimes occurring again um, is, is impacted, when they work together with community, when women and people of color aren't terrified for their lives, um, when crime investigations are solved faster, less crimes um, than the previous year, when officers strive to protect and serve as well as uphold the law, when the voice of the community um, say so, I guess is there, it doesn't seem anyone wants to get into, again, I don't, and releasing the names of reporters of incidents. Uh, Lydia, um, forgive me if, I, if I'm not, I don't wanna make an assumption who that might be. It could I can pull out a name or two. So again, this was pretty important. We appreciate your responses here that uh, I figured that's what we were talking about, but um, they really saying when the mayor releases reports. Um, so it's critically important that we ask this question about and have a good understanding of what does effectiveness look to you uh, look like to you as community members um, in this transparency. Um, one of the key things that, that we often recommend that there's a database that, that, that pr provide this information to the public that will allow us to know um, uh, what is happening with our police force and how is accountability being addressed and how is transparency being addressed. But one of the key things that I think in order to have any sort of change and in and, and, and direction is to have a good understanding of community 
voice related to effectiveness. So we're staying on this topic for a second to see if there's any more recommendations of, again, how would we measure effectiveness? I'm gonna summarize what I've heard through all of this. There's a concern that we have to change residents' perceptions of fear. If people are fearing, not only just police, but if they have a sense of fear that they cannot move and go throughout their neighborhoods, that if that changes, um, that will be an indicator of effectiveness. That if they feel that they can call the police and that response would be a humane response and they receive help, if they see police presence in the area, we say that would be an indicator of effectiveness as well and that they're engaging with community. Um, if, they're, if, if, if we know about officers of misconduct, that'll be very important. Uh, one respondent put here, so how are we supposed to feel safe reporting issues if our mayor is releasing the names and private information like addresses? Again, if the process and people's uh, personal safety is respected by all who are making decisions or who have access to that information of complaints, um, I, I, I'm just going to respond in that way that that might indicate effectiveness. So I, I, I think there can be a Additional questions related to this um, issue of accountability. So one, would you support changes? I would like to ask an open question and, 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 and the team could let me know if I'm going too far. Um, would you support changes in the state statutes that will allow for uh, a more uh, uh, fair, and let me state it correctly, um, that would change the, the, the new standards that guides uh, how, how officers are um, investigated or um, prosecuted for any misconduct. So let me say that again. Um, one of the key things about accountability is whether or not the prosecutor prosecutorial standards for suspect, sus, 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 suspected police misconduct um, meaning finding an officer's act with recklessness, with disregard for someone's life, causing that person death, that that should be uh, the change in prosecutorial standards. Um, right now, it's not. So the question was, how would you feel about that if they change the standards for prosecuting suspected police misconduct? How would you feel about that? And if you have an opinion, um, please give some sort of direction of uh, what that standard should reflect. Some say, I don't understand the way, what is the standard now? I don't understand what it is now and what change you're suggesting. Okay. I tried to capture that question in the chat. <laughs> I appreciate that. I mean, the easiest way for me to say it is that if, if you're going to change for how officers are prosecuted for suspected misconduct and you want to change the standards um, uh, for, for them engaging in any reckless, with any reckless disregard for someone's life, causing that person injury or death, how would you change? What standard would you want to, to set? The standards around qualified immunity needs to be revoked. We also need tighter standards for officers involved shooting. Another one we can ask related to this, um, there's a need, it's been discussed, to establish civil rights liability standards, um, meaning finding an officer that's, who has violated an individual's civil rights by acting with recklessness um, and disregard for their life, causing them persons serious injury or death. So again, it's another question about the standards. One is for prosecuting, the other one is uh, for civil liability, meaning that the family, those who have been injured can also file suit. And the question there is that, um, would you be interested in changing those standards? And if so, what do you think those standards should reflect? Yeah. 
And I'm sorry we're not we did not necessarily put it in there. We've just been efficient in moving forward with this uh, town hall and hearing from you. So we just thought we'd just add one more question. And I think I will turn it over because uh, I think we're having uh, one or two, and I just want to read those, and we can turn it over to community engagement. Uh, I would like to have the right to sue an officer in civil court if an officer violated my civil rights, and um, currently state law forbids that. The state law on body cam needs to provide for safer public access. Those are two responses. So thank you. So now we're going to turn it over, I believe, to Von Treese McDonald and to talk about community engagement practices. And Von Treese, I will add, is the eminent chair of our community engagement committee. So there is no one better equipped to talk about this section on community engagement practices. Thanks, Jess. I was going to try to introduce myself, but I appreciate it. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Um, as Jessica stated, I'm one of the co-chairs for the VPC Community Engagement Committee. And um, Serena set, up, set us up pretty nicely earlier, and she mentioned how over a year ago, we began our engagement work or really getting deep in our engagement work with a police legitimacy survey. But we've also really been focusing a lot on community policing. And before we get into the questions, I just want to give you the definition that we use at VPC. So for us, community policing is the police working together with the community to identify and solve problems. So I just invite you to keep that definition in mind as we go through um, this second survey that we're currently doing around the CBA. And so we wanted to focus on, in this piece, how police officers can create positive relationships with community residents, especially our youth, and then what activities are most meaningful to residents to build those relationships. Next slide, please. So some of the key feedback that we received so far from the survey is that it would help if our police officers met with neighborhood residents to create solutions to address problems that the residents have identified. And the other very popular response that we received is that the way that we would like to have officers dedicated to our communities, to our neighborhoods for at least one year. Um, our residents that responded to the survey found that it'd be extremely significant if an officer was dedicated and could build and establish a relationship with residents in those neighborhoods. Next slide, please. So as you think about those responses, and again, think about the definition of community policing, and thanks, Serena, for adding that to the chat. Our first uh, poll question for you is which program, as suggested by our survey responses, do you think would be most helpful to build trust in the community, especially with our youth? And I'll read it one more time for those I know probably can't see it. Which program, as suggested by our survey responses, do you think would be most helpful to build trust in community, especially with our youth? And the responses that are available are mentoring, sports or video game league, barbecue, food, et cetera, discussion groups, um, not, uh, don't focus on programs and then other programs. And if you choose other programs, if you feel comfortable, please elaborate in the chat. All right, so our top response was mentoring. Second was discussion groups. And third, sports or video game leagues. Thank you. Our next question which is our open-ended question. What are the best ways for police to build trust with you? And we're asking you to please respond in the chat. What are the best ways for police to build trust with our youth?
So I am seeing park, walk, get to know me, see me, get to know me, service, tutoring, building relationships early when youth have less apprehension about engaging with police. So starting young with our engagement, be truthful and genuine. You have to be willing to meet them where they are at. Find out what each youth is interested in. You guys are typing fast in this chat. Be present consistently just for fun, not always when there is an issue. So show up just to engage. Be present for more than just the time that the youth are being punished. Support, support local youth at sporting events and graduation. Volunteer with them. Talk in positive ways with youth and family all the time. Build trust with adults as well as youth, the community approach. Changing the way they actually police based on best practices designed around developmental standards. Watch what language is used. Don't talk bad about another youth, group of people, religion, etc. Don't do it for the selfie. Thank you, Megan. And we'll wait a few more seconds to see if there are additional responses to this question. Vaughn, there's one that you missed because they were okay. coming in so fast that I okay. want to read. Model positive engagement, not only with youth, but with affiliates of youth. Trust can't be gained if you see police mistreating adults in the lives of the youth. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. And I apologize if I missed any others. Okay, we can go to the next question. This is another open-ended question. If you could please type your responses in the chat. What are some problems, issues in your community that you would like police to help in solving? What are some problems, issues in your community? that you would like police help in solving. This gets to our definition of community policing. Talk to the youth through what is happening when they are in trouble or encounter police during an emergency. Help people understand why procedures are being done. No offense, but killer cops, none taken. Police brutality, people afraid to come forward about what they've witnessed. What is an issue in your community that you would like the police to help solving? The police straight up not responding or taking their time. I'm gonna stay here for a few seconds because I know we have issues in our community. Police involvement in drugs, illicit activities, no idea how this will get addressed, but it is a problem. Advocating for resources that will help the community, such as lighting, sidewalks, and addressing vacant buildings. People walking around with assault weapons. Victim blaming rather than helping solve the problem. Are there proactive things that police can do oh, before a crime happens? Jessica, is that a question that you are posing to the audience? Yeah, I think that's a, a question in general. Community policing is very much a proactive policing model. So what are things in neighborhoods that might contribute to crime that police could help residents to address mm -hmm. before it, a crime occurs? So are there proactive things that police can do before crimes happen? Which I think really connects to the establishing of the relationship, a lot of that feedback that we got earlier prior to this question. And then Craig, I see your fi the final comment saying that obviously we want help with ways to prevent crime. 
being present and willing to up patrol when people feel unsafe or suspect a crime may happen. And we can wait a few seconds to see if there are any other responses. And I believe, Jess, I am passing it over to you after this. No, it is yeah. next to Polly. Oh, Polly. Polly, Polly from Dogtown to... is up next. And Polly had the final answer. More coffee chat or community cafe model, shutting down open drug markets, especially in residential areas. Okay. Thank you all very much. Passing it on to Polly. Hello, everybody. I am Polly. I am one of the members of the community engagement committee. And I want to say gracias for being here and for also for taking the time to go through this process with us as we are trying to come up with better ways that we can reimagine what police safety is. So I I'm very lucky today to be discussing alternatives to police contacts. So as a clinical social worker, I think this is very, very important. So I wanna talk with you guys, how can we get help with issues that are not necessarily crime? Because when we look at some of um, the statistics, some of the, or most of the police calls are not related to crime. Um, let's talk about how trained professionals or community health workers could help respond to some of those 911 calls that are not related to crimes. Next. I don't know if you guys knew, but 80% of folks who answered our survey said that our police force is being asked to respond to too many calls that are not related to crimes, which kind of reflects the same that the data has shown. So you guys are right on target. Many of those calls are related to um, folks who are unhoused, drug and alcohol abuse, uh, mental health issues. And what our community is saying that they do not believe that our police officers are trained um, to deal with those calls. So when we look at the numbers um, based on your answers, 91% of you guys say, that um, police officers may benefit from some training related to addressing mental health cri crisis beyond some of the CID training, which is the crisis intervention training. 81% um, of you guys thought that police officers may benefit from uh, having more training related to how to work with children who are at the scene of a violent incident, um, how to work with our own house neighbors um, and also how to respond to drug abuse or overdoses. So I wanna thank you again for taking the time to respond to our old survey. And now I wanna remind you that our survey, our new survey is still open. So please, please, please um, make sure you fill out this survey. Now I have a poll question for you guys because what would we do without poll questions? I think they keep the fun going. Plus I wanna make sure you guys have that blood flowing. So I wanna know, have you ever called 911 for yourself or someone experiencing any of this, being in a situation where they are unhoused or at risk of becoming unhoused, a uh, drug or alcohol uh, overdose, uh, a mental health crisis, something related to property crime, or being a victim of assault? And then the other question is that some cities like Berkeley are in the process or in, of engaging unarmed civilians to help out with other tasks, like I make a list because I was very curious about it, how to work with the unhoused, folks who have mental illness, and also they're thinking about creating a separate department that will handle parking and traffic uh, issues. So tell me what you think, I wanna see it. And while I wait, I wanna give a shout out. There are some really cool people who are watching this 
webinar town hall like i'm intimidated because i shouldn't be here i some of you guys i see dr rosenfeld i see john shadenoff you guys should be right here so i want to hear what you guys have to say all right so have you ever called um 911 the top one was related to poverty crime uh, actually, we had a tie in, in, in terms of multiple choice. 38% voted for alcohol, drug abuse, mental health crisis, and violent crime. That is incredible. And 8% related to issues related to folks who are unhoused. Um, so that's something that we need to consider. How can we reimagine safety for our community um, where we are lessening some of that burden on our police officers. So now, so one of the questions we have here is, do you think that the program that is gonna start at Berkeley would work here? And the majority of you guys said no, and 38% said, I don't know. So that's then, this is pretty telling, something we really need to think about or perhaps learn more. Uh, let's see, I see a question from Craig. Today we've spent some time together. That is true. Craig is talking about traffic stops. That is one of the most dangerous things one can do. And also from what I had been reading today, it also says that traffic enforcement increases the encounters um, that affect black and brown folks that puts them most at, at risk. Oh, uh, Ms. Meredith says she could not submit an answer, and it was a maybe for number two. I really appreciate you guys giving Yeah, it looks like some people who didn't have an answer for the first one weren't able to submit an answer for the second question. So please, please feel free to answer in the chat whether you think that unarmed folks um, doing some of those might work. And feel free to drop in um, any concerns you would have or um, other comments. That is, uh, John is making an interesting point. So he's saying traffic stops would not be so dangerous if they were not tied to crime detection. Do you guys have other ideas? How can we reimagine public safety? Um, so letter M is talking about traffic stops. What if a driver has a gun? Um, I am not familiar with the CAHOOTS model, but there is something here that um, we have not talked about, which is perhaps our policies in our state that that could also put our officers and our citizens at harm. That would be an interesting conversation. So Bailey saying that social workers could respond to mental health issues with or even without police. That way, there's not fear of being arrested or increasing chances of agitation. Yeah, we're trained on de-escalation. Uh, Megan mentioned um, that cahoots uh, means they respond to mental health calls instead of police. We've seen that in some other cities like um, some models in Chicago. Holly, don't try to read all of that. I just okay. dropped it in the chat for people that wanted more information. <laughs> Thank you. This is good for me to learn about Kahoot and other folks. Uh, Ms. Atiyah is saying traffic stops also become dangerous to drivers of color because of racial profiling and the possibility of excessive use of force. That I've heard that a lot. And even for myself, um, that was something that I was concerned about when I had to work in a small municipality. Alisa is saying that if someone wants to share the last video from Forward Through Ferguson, um, please put it in the chat so we can uh, learn more about people who are employed who are using the CAHOOTS model. 
All right, um, let, let me see the other question. So now we have an open-ended question. So what concerns would you have about having unarmed civilians do traffic patrols or stops? And while you guys are responding, Bailey mentioned here that an agency in Indianapolis has been used using trained retired officers to respond to familiar faces who call 911. And Serena is also mentioning the prevalence of guns in Missouri is significant. And that is true. Um, you guys can really check a lot of um, the research being done by Dr. Daniel Webster, Jonathan Metzel, um, Dr. Rosenfeld does some, it, it is our leading criminologist at, I'm biased because he's also watching us. Um, so M is saying um, that they would love it for citizens, but definitely we worry about the safety of the officers, um, safety and preparedness for all. Um, someone is talking to us about what kind of training would they have? Well, you know what, like as a social worker, we get a lot of de-escalation training. And when I worked in clinics, we definitely did not have a gun and had to de-escalate some really uh, intense situations. So I'm sure we can all um, learn from some of that training too. But the, the access to guns is definitely something that we need to consider. Uh, Michelle is saying the civilians are not being taken seriously. Uh, civilians are not being trained or prepared to handle situations that can escalate and lead to violence. Uh, Megan says that she would prefer more time and money spent on traffic calming methods. Yes, we've had concerns in some of our streets uh, being used as if they were uh, ra uh, racing streets. Uh, Miss Becky saying we would need a lot of education and publicity um, so people being stopped would know whether a civilian is armed and also like how to disclose that you are armed and still as a civilian stay safe. Um, Craig is saying traffic dire direction is one thing, but stops are another. So two different issues that we should definitely address separately, but also there's a relationship. I appreciate you guys uh, definitely dropping all these uh, notes and know that we see you that we're not ignoring your comments, that we are going to take note after the event and we reconvene as a committee. And plug in here, St. Louis Area Violence Prevention Commission, visit our website, um, join a committee, be part of the change. All right, show me the next question. All right, so this is an open-ended question, guys. So as a resident of the Lou, what type of resources would you like to have more information about to meet the needs of you and your neighbors. Like for example, did you know you can dial 211 from your cell phone to like get some resources? A lot of folks don't know. 211, super easy to remember, but give me some, some ideas of what else, what can we do better to share the love of information with our community? Another way to ask this, and I'll just jump in is, what are problems that you see that you don't know if there's a resource out there that can help meet those needs? I'll cheat a little. Oh, Bailey said better promote that non-emergency number. That is true. Uh, let's talk about resources for the unhoused. Uh, how to address drugs in schools. Um, how can we address medical or mental health emergencies? Um, how can we get more information about violence pre prevention programs? Ms. Meredith is saying how to address domestic violence. I like it, John. Neighbor to neighbor mediation. And, and there are different groups. John, do you mind dropping in the different resources that you are aware for neighbor to neighbor mediation? Because I, I think you're a mediator.
Erin said, Conflict Resolution Center for Mediation. Thank you. Uh, Miss M or Mr. M says, High school alcohol parties in hotel rooms. Yes, definitely. Some of us may, perhaps may have done that 30 years ago. Yes, not good. Um, community Mediation Services. Thank you, John. Bailey, Resources for the Deaf, Hard of Hearing, or those whose English is a second language, like myself, yes. Atia is mentioning that we need to definitely have more resources for high concentration of poverty, unemployment, that are the root causes of some of our issues, right? And we need to address racism, all of those. Um, and young people need access to jobs, leadership opportunities, ways to contribute to our community in a positive way and pathways to post high school career opportunities, right? Not all of us will go to a four-year college. There's many, many different avenues or ways that we can uh, go on our way to earn living wages. All right, what do we have next? Oh, I'm done. I think it goes back to Jessica. I, again, I want to thank you guys for entertaining us today and your input is super valued. We see you. Thank you, Polly. And Polly is also a rock star because she is not feeling well this evening. So we really appreciate her helping us with everything. So what I'm going to talk about is kind of where do we go from here? So the future of public input in the CBA is really about how do we infuse that community voice into the CBA negotiations? So in St. Louis, in St. Louis City and St. Louis County, there has never been an official way for people to have their say in the collective bargaining agreement. It's been a closed process. Um, and so we are calling for, and many different groups are calling for opening up those negotiations to allow for public input. And so this section is really going to be about what would that look like going forward? We're collecting information now that we're going to provide to all of the negotiating parties, but ideally we'd like to have a, uh, a formal process going forward. So next slide. I think we're one too far. There we go. So um, in our survey, we asked people if you could only have input into one part of the CBA, which part would be the most important? And so this comes from the fact that some other cities don't open up the entire collective bargaining agreement to public input. They only um, allow certain pieces to be opened up. And unsurprisingly, the use of force investigations was the number one piece that our survey respondents would like to have input into. The second is information and sharing with community. This is not surprising. We heard over and over, both from police officers and from the residents that we talked to, that transparency and accountability was the number one concern. 15% also said they wanted to have input into officer training standards. So some of officer training is mandated and then some officers are allowed to have, I think it's 16 hours where they can choose what they'd like to get training in. So um, the third most popular answer was officer training standards. And, and we asked, how would you like to have input? We know everybody has different comfort levels for public speaking or for um, writing. They have different um, accessibility issues. So we asked, how would you prefer to have input? And um, it was pretty evenly split between public meetings where they would be facilitated discussions like this type of, of format, although hopefully in person once uh, COVID has left. I think those are much more effective. Um, uh, an online survey, we've had some really great responses. We have, I think at this point, over 200 responses to our online survey. It's easy to share and it's easy to have input anonymously. And then there's uh, notice and comment, which is basically the government puts out a draft and says, read over this and then submit your comments. And we'd like to know what you think about it. So it was pretty evenly split. 
um, between those ways. And those are all things that have done, been done in other jurisdictions. So next slide. We're gonna ask you how you would feel mo most comfortable. Um, who would you feel most comfortable with leading this? We talked earlier about who would you feel comfortable reporting um, misconduct to. And so now we wanna know in a poll question, who would you feel most comfortable with leading future input? Would you wanna give that input directly to the police department? Would you wanna give it directly to the city of St. Louis? And for police department, that could mean the department or the police union. I realized I forgot to make that an option. And the third option is a neutral party. Feel free to make suggestions about who you think would be good, who you would feel comfortable leading this. And then the second poll question is, how would you like to be able to participate in that process? How likely would you be? So feel free to say, not at all likely. I don't want to be involved. You know, I came to this meeting, but that's about it. Likely, very likely, or it would depend on who's facilitating it. So feel free to um, fill in those questions in the poll. We'll give it a few seconds. Um, if you have any additional comments, feel free to drop them in the chat box as well. So we'll give you a few more seconds before we close the poll. All right, it looks like the majority of people would like to have a neutral party leading future public input into the CBA. Again, if you have ideas on who that could be, feel free to follow up um, and drop those in the chat box. And for how likely people would be, it looks like people are interested in it. Um, unsurprisingly, uh, because you all are here tonight at an event talking about public input into the collective bargaining process. So um, I'm not surprised that people are very likely, but it does look like um, there are at least a few people for whom it would depend on who's facilitating it. Um, John Chasnoff says uh, he's looking for a neutral party, the group that led the meetings related to the police chief's search. Bailey has advocated for a mix of community members and officers. Um, so we could see both sides, that's a great option. Um, I think, I think um, we've made the effort to really try and listen to both sides and having both sides represented would be a good way to lead that. I think we had someone that had a hand raised. Megan, do you wanna drop a question into chat? So feel free to add, uh, Megan has said that she would like a local university to lead it, um, to lead the public input process. Not a problem, Megan, thank you. Um, so I think we have a lot of great options here in St. Louis. We're, we're resource rich with that. Um, and so I think we do have the ability to pull together whether it's civilians and law enforcement, whether it's a neutral third party or just to support the police department and the city with getting that input. The next question we wanna ask really gets to the reason that we're doing this. We wanna know what would it mean to you as a resident to officially have input in the police department CBA? What would change or how would you feel different about being able to have that public input? So. I'll give people a few minutes to drop those responses into the chat as well. And while you're doing that, while you're, while you're considering that, I do wanna talk a little bit about precedent because I think when we're talking about making a change um, as big as opening up the collective bargaining agreement for the first time, that some people might be hesitant, might wanna know what's going on in other areas. So in Austin, Texas, the Austin Justice Coalition worked to open up the, the negotiation of the CBA. Um, and they actually have a seat at the uh, bargaining table. 
Um, as Serena mentioned, um, the, the bargaining is closed here. Um, Portland, Oregon has opened up parts of their CBA to public input. So I mentioned earlier how some people, some places only open up the, the uh, discipline policy or the use of force investigations to public input. Portland is one of those areas. And then other states have done it based on their open records laws. So they've held open meetings where the CBA is discussed. So there is um, precedent for that. So we do want to make it, we wouldn't be starting from scratch. There is some precedent we could go for. So what would it mean to you as a resident to officially have input? Bailey said, I'd be more willing to actually pay attention to what is being said. And of course, I lost it. Um, many of my peers have expressed the same thing, um, wanting to have their voice heard. M said, I would feel empowered and listened to and that I had an avenue to address wrongs. Uh, Becky, the education and transparency required would increase my trust in the department and my conversation about St. Louis would be more, poli would be more positive. Um, something that we can always use is more positive talk um, about St. Louis. John says, some greater measure of control over the things that impact my life and my neighbor's lives. And Megan says, having input is one thing which I would feel happy about. Having the input put into action would make me feel valued. And I think that's a great point, that um, input is one thing and community voice is great. And we want that process to be transparent. But ultimately, the larger goal would, to have, would be to have some of the community's priorities actually put into action. Polly has chimed in um, that it would mean transparency of officers doing great and those doing wrong. And I think that's, that's part of this bigger discussion is how do we not only highlight when there's a problem, but how do we support law enforcement who are doing the right thing um, and, and really support that, those positive things. Um, Katiri says, I think it's essential to improve police community relationships and, and we do as well. So feel free to drop some additional comments in there, but um, let's move on to the next slide. So please feel free, add any additional comments. We'll hang out here um, and leave the chat open for a while. Um, I know that Ola has just dropped uh, some links in the chat. So our CBA survey will be open through October 4th. Uh, it has similar questions to what we asked today, but it also has different questions. And so even if you attended tonight, please feel free to take the survey, share it with your network. It's not just for city residents. Um, we know that county residents are affected by city policing and vice versa. So please feel free to take and share that. We will prepare a report with our survey and town hall results. So what we want to do is we want to be able to say, last year we did community engagement. We listened to community. We did a survey. We interviewed law enforcement. These are the themes we heard. And this is what that would look like in the CBA. And here are the priorities that people have identified. Here's how they answered our survey results and um, going forward. We will send that to all of the negotiating parties. We will send it to the chief of police. We will send it to the mayor's office. We will send it to Public Safety Director Judge Jimmy Edwards. We will send it to um, the St. Louis Police Officers Association. We'll send it to the Personnel Director. We'll also send it to the Ethical Society of Police. While they are not a bargaining member, um, they are a police union that represents some of the police in our area. So we think it's important for them to have the information as well. We'll also release it publicly. We're advocating for transparency in the police department. So our goal is to be transparent as well. So we will be um, sharing that publicly. It'll be available on our website. It will be available on the websites of some of our partners. Um, and then Homegrown STL will be providing some more information. 
through town halls about their report. Dr. Joe, would you like to jump in there and talk a little bit about what your plan is going forward? Well, we're hoping, first of all, thank you all for, for this partnership here. And we're hoping to continue partnership with, with this group and others who are focused on the CBA and making sure we follow this um, change process all the way through until this strong community voice um, that is informing these uh, agreements and that we're in full partnership with law enforcement leadership to, to increase the, the personal safety of um, St. Louis residents. So for us, with Homegrown, we're looking to, to continue this partnership around a few other priority topics, not just the CBA, but also some of the data, data and, and, and data innovation um, approaches that, that can lead us to having the best database system. Uh, we wanna be a part of that, so we're gonna be trying to reach out to find those partners who want to help law enforcement have the database capacity um, so it's not, they're not burdened with coming up with this strategy themselves. We have wonderful institutions and um, tech innovation in this region that could be very helpful should they uh, desire that partnership that they, they don't have to do this heavy lifting. And we have good policing and information um, that, that represents transparency and fairness, but also help law enforcement to do their job without interfering with their ability to, to actually um, keep people safe. Uh, we we want to have a focus again on another kind of personal safety model of policing. And again, that's our approach that we want to prioritize. This is not just about public safety, where it's always a conversation about how do we keep the public safe from young black males, but how do you really advance the personal sense of safety among black males, which would result in them having to, to not turn to alternative means to protect themselves, which can lead to to higher violence and, and, and crime in the, in the region. So we look forward to finding partners and continue to work on this CBA issue and as well as those other issues that's lifted up in our, in our report. So thank you. Thank you. And the link to their report is in the chat. Um, I see people uh, dropping some additional comments. Um, I will say that I dropped into chat there at our link to our Get Involved tab. If you would like to be involved, there's a lot of different ways you can get involved. Uh, as Polly said, uh, you can join a committee, but that's not required, but you can learn more about the Violence Prevention Commission. And really what we mean when we say we're reimagining public safety and violence prevention. Um, you may not think that you have um, a stake in violence prevention or your agency isn't doing violence prevention, but one of the things that we talk about is that so many things along the lifespan for people are violence prevention. So um, mental health care, education, workforce development, um, all of these are violence prevention and all of these are groups that are involved in our public health approach to violence prevention. The Coalition Against Police Crimes and Repression is also doing some work around the collective bargaining agreement and disciplinary process. They are releasing their information, I believe, Monday of next week, if all goes according to plan. So check them out on their social media. Um, M says, I'm wondering which is more effective in decreasing the use of excessive force, a robust civilian oversight board or a better CBA? My guess would be yes. There's not a wrong answer to that question and probably both need to be strengthened in order to uh, make lasting change. And Polly is giving a shout out to Life Outside of Violence, which is the hospital-based violence intervention program. Um, take a look at their website. It's a great program. It's evidence-based and they're doing a really good job with it in St. Louis and the implementation. So feel free to drop any additional comments or questions in the chat that you want us to take into account. Um, take the survey if you would like, it'll be open through October 4th. Follow us on our social media where we'll post the closed caption video uh, probably tomorrow. Um, so anyone who wasn't able to attend or had technical difficulties will be able to access that and take the survey as well. Um, I want to thank you all for taking the time. I know everybody is Zoom meeting out. Zoom fatigue is real. And so we appreciate everyone taking the time in an e 
in an evening meeting to come out and talk about this important issue and to support the work that we're doing with community to really build a safer St. Louis. So unless anyone has additional comments, thank you, thank you, thank you. We very much appreciate it. And if you have any, quest any questions, I will drop my email address in the chat and you can feel free to email me with any follow-up thoughts. All right, and thank you, Jessica, for doing all of the heavy lifting to keep this moving forward over the last few weeks. Uh, Jessica and, and the team, thank you all. And let me just give a thanks to Janet Gillow for our excellent work and, and, and for really sticking in there with us. You've been an excellent partner. We wanna thank you for um, powering you know, this technology and helping us put this uh, webinar and town hall together. So thank you. All right, our meeting is officially adjourned. <laughs>